It was spring, 1917. The Great War mercilessly staggered on. By the time the catastrophic meat grind was over, upwards of 10 million of the continent's young men would lie pulped across the fields of Europe. Yet unbeknownst at the time, a still deadlier force was about to be unleashed. Bolshevism, international communism, would in the long century ahead annihilate ten times the dead of World War I. It was with a sense of awe that they turned upon Russia the most grisly of weapons. They transported Lenin in a sealed train like a plague bacillus from Switzerland into Russia. March 1917, Winston Churchill writing in his diary. If the Germans could insert Lenin, that most grisly of weapons, into Russia, they were confident he would seize control of the newborn revolution and fulfill his promise to pull Russia out of the war. Germany could then forget the Eastern Front and throw all her armies against the Allies to the West. Given his implacable opposition to the imperialist World War I, it was always going to be a major feat for the Bolshevik leader to return to Russia. Throughout that previous winter, Lenin had been quietly living in Zurich, Switzerland with his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, of very little concern to anyone, banished indefinitely from his homeland. They lodged with a cobbler and rarely went out. The Great Revolutionary was something of a bookworm going to the public library every day when it opened at nine, coming home to his tiny apartment for lunch at noon, and then going back to the library from 1 p.m. until closing. There he read longingly of earlier revolutions, the Paris Commune above all. On the afternoon of March 15, 1917, Mieczysław Bromsky, a young Polish revolutionary, raced up the stairs to the Lenin's one-room apartment just as the couple had finished lunch. Haven't you heard the news? he exclaimed. There's a revolution in Russia. While the red flag was flying over the capital, the Tsar telegraphed the Tsarina, Wonderful weather. Hope you are well and calm. Many troops sent from the front. With kind love, Nikki. The many troops obeyed their officers until they reached Petrograd and there joined the people in the streets. A group of about 20 Russian exiles arrived at Lenin's home to discuss this important event. Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, explained. From the moment the news of the February Revolution came, Illich burned with eagerness to go to Russia. Alexander Parvus also arrived in Switzerland. The former German Social Democrat who had originally helped to fund Iskra, the Russian revolutionary newspaper, had now gone over to the German government, operating as an arms contractor and recruiter for the war effort. He had been heavily involved in the German propaganda drive among Tsarist troops to destabilize Tsar Nicholas. Pavus made contact with General Erich Ludendorff, who later admitted his involvement in his autobiography. Our government, in sending Lenin to Russia, took upon itself a tremendous responsibility. From a military point of view, his journey was justified, for it was imperative that Russia should fall. After all the revolutionaries were on board, and once the carriages' four doors at the Russian end were closed shut, Fritz Platten, a Swiss socialist, marked them with chalk in German as sealed, which served as an international border between Russia and Germany, two nations that were technically at war. The train was given a high traffic priority by the Germans. Crown Prince Wilhelm, the eldest son of Kaiser Wilhelm II, was delayed for two hours to let Lenin's train pass. That is precisely how it turned out. Lenin was quite willing to accept help from his sworn enemies, although he went to some length afterward to cover up the German origins of the plan. Later, it was important to him to call it a sealed train, a phrase that became famous in history. He described a train passing through Europe secretly in a state of extraterritoriality without passport controls, almost as if it did not exist, gliding silently through the cities of war-torn Europe under German protection, carrying its deadly cargo toward Germany's weakened adversary on the Eastern Front. It was a long journey interrupted by occasional stops when the train would be guided into a siding and the authorities asked questions in whispers. North of Berlin, the train became an amphibious vehicle as the carriage was separated from its locomotive and placed on a ferry to cross the Baltic. In Sweden, the plans were nearly derailed because the extraterritorials had no papers. The only known photo of the group was taken in Stockholm. 
Here, Lenin and his fellow Bolsheviks walked through the city accompanied by local Swedish socialists. Because of Lenin's shabby look, his comrades convinced him to buy some new clothing and shoes at a local department store. But German efficiency took over again and soon they were on their way. From Stockholm, the train proceeded very far to the north, nearly to the Arctic Circle, before crossing into the Grand Duchy of Finland and curving south again towards St. Petersburg. It was 11 p.m. on April 16th when Lenin approached the Finland station. Lenin's arrival in 1917 was orchestrated by cynical German leaders who were eager to weaken Russia's fragile government by sending in a well-known incendiary element. On April 16, 1917, a short train carrying 32 passengers steamed into one of St. Petersburg's less distinguished stations, completing an eight-day journey from Zurich. These passengers were arriving late to a revolution that had started without them. Earlier that year, after food riots broke out in the imperial capital, but one of them, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, would quickly seize control of events. Reflecting on these events years later, Winston Churchill would compare Yulianov or Lenin, as he styled himself to a plague bacillus that had been introduced into a body at precisely the moment it could do the most harm. The train injected the bacillus late at night when it arrived and was greeted by a delirious crowd. The next day, Lenin was off and running. In a notorious Soviet-era painting, Lenin is shown descending from the train to greet an exuberant crowd of admirers at Petrograd's Finland station. Behind him looms the image of a smiling Stalin, as if that future tyrant had been aboard as well. A visual fairy tale, in Meridale's words, to reinforce Stalin's claim that he had always been Lenin's principal lieutenant. In fact, Stalin was still facing internal exile in Siberia before reaching Petrograd in March. Lenin was greeted by hundreds of followers, among them prominent Bolsheviks like Lev Kamenev and Joseph Stalin, while others, most notably Grigory Zinoviev and Grigory Sokolnikov, accompanied him on the train. Stalin later had all these same people liquidated in the Great Purge, accused of being fifth columnist. For many Russians, exhausted by war and privation, it was a time of immense hope. The Germans who had sent Lenin were also hopeful. Soon after his arrival, a German diplomat in Sweden wrote a note to a colleague. Lenin's entry into Russia is successful. He is working exactly as we would wish.